Good afternoon, everyone, and sorry for, for this sh short delay. Uh, we are here for a regular press conference regarding coronavirus disease COVID-19. And uh, as most of the days, we have uh, WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of WHO Emergencies, and Dr. Sylvie Briand, Director for Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness. Um, just uh, one little note, uh, we have changed the system through which we are sending our notifications to, uh, to, to journalists around the world. So if there are any issues with that, please let us know. But hopefully uh, all those who have not been receiving are receiving now our notes. Uh, we will have an audio file and transcript as always at the end of this press briefing. And I will give the floor immediately to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to start today by talking not about COVID-19, but about uh, Syria. Since the 1st of December, dozens of health facilities have suspended services in the Idlib and Aleppo areas. Out of nearly 550 health facilities in northwest Syria, only about half are operational. Two attacks on health facilities took place yesterday afternoon on two separate hospitals in Aleppo. Luckily, there were no casualties. We repeat, health facilities and health workers are not a legitimate target in conflict, and attacks on health are a breach of international law. Nearly 900,000 people have been displaced, including half a million children. Children are particularly prone to hypotherm hypothermia and respiratory tract infections, and due to lack of uh, shelter, many of them are sleeping in the open with their families uh, exposed uh, to these uh, elements. In the coming days, WHO is sending essential medicine and supplies across the border from Turkey to Syria, and we are sending supplies for trauma, intensive and surgical care to Idlib and Aleppo governorates, in addition to drugs for non-communicable diseases and primary health care. So, although we are now devoting a lot of attention to COVID-19, WHO is still responding to many other emergencies around the world. Let me now turn the latest on COVID-19. As of 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, China has reported 72,528 cases to WHO, including 1,850 deaths. In the past 24 hours, China has reported 1,800 new cases, including both clinically and lab-confirmed cases. Outside China, there are now 804 cases in 24 countries, with three deaths. In the past 24 hours, there have been 110 new cases outside China, including 99 on the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship. We have now had cases of COVID-19 outside China for more than a month. We're supporting national authorities in every country that has cases to track the virus and understand how people were infected. So far, there are 92 cases in 12 countries outside China of human-to-human -human transmission. At the moment, we don't have data on cases outside China. At the moment, we don't have enough data on cases outside China to make a meaningful comparison on the severity of disease or the case fatality rate. We are following up with countries to get more information about what happens about each case and the outcome. However, we have not yet seen the sustained local transmission 
except in specific circumstances like the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Yesterday, I spoke to Singapore's Minister of Health and we're very impressed with the efforts they're making to find every case, follow up with contacts and stop transmission. Singapore is leaving no stone unturned, testing every case of influenza-like illness and pneumonia, and so far they have not found evidence of community transmission. I also spoke to the Minister of Health of Malaysia to discuss the Western Dam case and other aspects of their preparations. These signals show the importance of all countries being ready for the arrival of the virus to treat patients with dignity and compassion, to protect health workers, and to prevent onward transmission. Many countries are taking steps to prepare themselves with WHO support. We have shipped supplies of personal protective equipment to 21 countries and will ship to another 106 countries in the coming weeks. By the end of this week, 40 countries in Africa and 29 in the Americas are due to have the ability to detect COVID-19. Many of these countries have been sending samples to other countries for testing, waiting several days for results. Now they can do it themselves within 24 to 48 hours. Some countries in Africa, including DRC, are now leveraging the capacity they have built up to test for Ebola, to test for COVID-19. This is a great example of how investing in health systems can pay dividends for health security. Other countries like Namibia, Nigeria and Timor-Leste are running workshops with the media to ensure accurate and reliable reporting. Several countries are prioritizing surveillance and monitoring at ports of entry, including Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Serbia, and South Sudan. We're also working with partners in some of the most fragile contexts, from Syria to the Central African Republic, to prepare countries for the arrival of the virus. There are many other examples. We still have a chance of preventing a broader global crisis. WHO will continue working night and day with all countries to prepare them. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, for journalists who are dialing in by phone, it's a star nine, and you will be put in queue. Those who are watching us uh, through uh, Zoom online, Live. it's clicking raise hands on your right-hand side of the screen. We will start by taking questions from the floor. Jamie, Jeremy, then Shane. Shane. <coughs> Right. Please uh, use the mic. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Jamie, Associated Press. Um, you mentioned the Diamond Princess, and you mentioned that there are some specific instances where there has been some transmission outside of, of China. Um, how is it possible that this ship, which was meant to be quarantined, are you listening? <laughs> Sorry. Um, that was meant to be a quarantine has turned out to be a vector or a, has actually turned out to spread the, the um, this COVID-19 more than it's done anything to stop it. Thanks. Question in there, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Could you repeat it? Because uh, you know me well enough. <laughs> the um, yeah, the situation on the on the on the on the ship uh, obviously has has evolved, and uh, the the authorities in Japan. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> initially made a decision to quarantine all their passengers on that ship, which uh, allowed passengers to be kept together in in an environment where they were um, uh, could be observed and where they could have separate accommodations and everything else. This was much more preferable, obviously, at the time than necessarily having everyone disperse uh, around the world. But obviously, the situation on the ground has changed, and clearly there's been more transmission than expected on the ship, and I, I think the authorities in Japan are adjusting to that reality now and, and taking the necessary public health measures with other countries to, uh, to uh, evacuate people uh, and, uh, and deal with their follow-up in a different way. 
but uh, it's very easy in retrospect to make judgments on public health decisions made at a certain point. How, how do you explain that? I think it's, been, it's clear that, uh, and I've said it here in previous press conferences, that there are uh, sometimes environments in which the viruses can spread uh, and uh, cruise ships and, and other uh, hotel metropole I've mentioned before and others. There are particular uh, uh, environments in which disease can spread in a more efficient way. Uh, but again, in terms of the overall um, uh, number of people who are on the ship, the vast majority of people on the ship do not have uh, COVID-19. A good number do, and a good number have very, very mild symptoms. So I think uh, we need to, again, uh, keep our heads here and put this in perspective. It's an unfortunate event uh, occurring on the ship, and uh, we trust that the authorities in Japan and the governments who are taking back people will be able to follow up those individuals in the appropriate way to ensure that uh, they get the appropriate care if, if, if they are cases and if not that they are reintegrated into their communities. But uh, yes, it will be very important to study uh, this particular event and see what the uh, issues have been that have led to transmission to, uh, to the, 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 the people who have been on that ship. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, then Shane, then Nina. Uh, if you could just press the little press button. The little yes, thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. Can, okay. Um, I would like to have your, your comment on the recent measures taken in Beijing. Basically, everyone leaving the, the, the city is placed under quarantine. I don't think you, you, uh, you had a comment on that yesterday, so I'd like to have a, a comment on that. Is it, do you think it's effective? Do you think it's too much? I remember that, that at the beginning of the crisis, you hoped that uh, the confinement measures won't take too long in Hubei. Apparently, that's completely the opposite now. So just a word about the, those recent measures and uh, maybe from Dr. Briand in French, if I may. You want me to start in French? Oui, ça va. Okay, d'accord. Non, je pense que... Toute mesure de santé publique, en fait, peut être évaluée après un certain temps. Et donc, pour l'instant, les évaluations qu'on a sur ces mesures sont surtout à partir de modélisations mathématiques où on met les données dans la machine et on voit avec différents scénarios, en fonction des mesures, quels auraient été les résultats attendus et quels sont ceux qu'on a actuellement. Et on a vu donc que probablement la réduction des mouvements avait permis de, de, de réduire en fait la vitesse de propagation de cette épidémie de quelques jours à l'intérieur de la Chine et de quelques semaines à l'extérieur de la Chine. Donc, basé sur ces premières estimations, euh, le, dans ce cas-là, on prend les mesures euh, complémentaires en fonction de l'intensité de, de transmission euh, dans certaines localités. Donc, euh, c'est ce qui s'est passé à, à Pékin. Euh, ils ont euh, donc pris les mesures un peu plus euh, euh, drastiques pour pouvoir justement limiter les mouvements et, et permettre de mieux contenir l'épidémie à cet endroit-là. Donc, est-ce que c'est efficace Ça, on le saura, je pense, dans quelques jours, puisque on a maintenant un peu mieux cerné les, les durées d'hospitalisation, aussi les durées entre le moment où la maladie commence et le moment où les gens sont complètement non contagieux sur certaines études. Et il, il s'écoule à peu près 20 jours entre le moment où la maladie commence et le moment où les gens... Euh, sont vraiment euh, guéris. Donc euh, ça nous donne euh, aussi une, une idée de, du temps qu'il va nous falloir pour pouvoir évaluer l'efficacité des mesures. Very short English version of what is. <laughs> so, okay, currently the measures are evaluated based on the modeling. Uh, and so we uh, use uh, uh, the data we have uh, to um, imagine what could be the scenario if nothing is done and what could be the scenario with the current, uh, what is the, the current uh, uh, the re situation with uh, the data we have. And so it, modelization has shown that uh, 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 those measures on uh, movement restriction have delayed 
uh, the, the dissemination of the outbreak of two or three days within China and, and uh, a few weeks uh, outside China, two or three weeks. So uh, based on this, uh, then it shows that those measures, if well implemented, could have uh, an impact on the uh, propagation of the outbreak and that's why uh, measures are now taken in, in Beijing uh, to uh, strengthen uh, the control of the outbreak and, and um, um, postpone the peak uh, uh, postpone the, um, the, the peak of it, give more time to, to uh, treat uh, the, the problem. Uh, so, but in fact, we will know only after some time when uh, those measures are really effective because it takes more or less from some studies we have now uh, to around 19, 19 days between the onset of symptoms and the days where people are completely uh, cleared from the virus. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Uh, Shane, then Lisa. Uh, no, that one just behind, S small one just uh, below. Okay, thank you. So my first question, uh, yeah, I have an original question. It's about uh, Dr. Ch Tedros, you mentioned from China, China Central Television. Sorry to mention that. Mm. Dr. Tedros, you mentioned that you are not getting enough data from the other countries outside of China. So what's the problem inside of that? Are the countries not willing to provide the data or what's the reason behind that um, problem? Mm -hmm. And also for... Uh, Dr. Brown, that you just mentioned uh, there's a modeling that two days has been delayed for the transmission and two or three weeks for the world, uh, two days for China. So uh, that is a WHO modeling or that's from the China side that you are quoting from? Yeah. Would you like to take it? Sure. Um, with regard to uh, a data from all countries, we, we fully recognize that all the affected countries are uh, under extreme duress and their primary responsibility is to their, their own citizens and, and to dealing with the public health challenge that they face. But we continually ask that they share with us the, the core data that we need. Um, and uh, I would say that it, it hasn't been absolutely smooth sailing with, with any country so far. It's been uh, because we've we've had to request a number of countries to speed up their data sharing, but we don't believe this has not been through a lack of transparency. Quite frankly, this has been through the urgency and the difficulties of gathering data in these situations, collating that data, and then sharing it outside a country. And in some cases, there are data protection issues, there are citizen protection issues, uh, there are issues around sharing any kind of line listed or individualized data on individual patients, and then there are some logistics issues. We're very pleased with, uh, with, in general, overall, with the cooperation we've received on, uh, on data sharing, and, and we hope that that continues. Um, we do want to be able to see more and more data on um, things like community studies, hospital uh, transmission investigations. Uh, Jamie, the investigations aboard the Sea Princess to establish exactly what the conditions were that led to transmission. And uh, we would obviously like to be seeing those uh, investigations early so we can use them to learn lessons in, in other circumstances that we may face in the coming days and weeks. So again, we encourage all of our partners, uh, both government and academic, to share with us that information which they can, um, which will help us as a global agency to provide the best possible uh, advice and, and evidence to countries. And just while I have the floor, just reflecting on our colleague's question about the control measures in Beijing, I think if you look at what's happening in Wuhan now, the government authorities in China have spent a number of weeks pressuring the virus, and you saw the numbers have dropped away. Now they've engaged in door-to-door -door surveillance, and they're going around doing active surveillance. This is a very good public health practice. Your first... Uh, your first, uh, I think we've got gremlins in the system today everywhere. Right? The screens are going crazy, the lights are going crazy. Um, but we like to see progressive implementation of public health measures. So the first objective in, in Wuhan was to contain the virus at the epicenter, and you've heard the Director General speak, fight the virus at the epicenter. Suppressing that virus now allows space to really do much more active surveillance. 
while the authorities there are doing that act of surveillance, they don't want the virus to return to other places. Beijing is a central point in the country where many, many workers return to. So what China are trying to do is while they're getting success in putting out one fire, they don't want the fire to start somewhere else. So they're taking very directed measures to ensure that people returning to the city are observed and monitored. Now you can argue uh, whether those measures are excessive or whether they're restrictive on people, but you, there's a lot at stake here. There's an awful lot at stake here in terms of uh, public health and in terms of uh, not only the public health of China, but of, of all people in the world. So what we like to see is well thought out, evidence-based public health measures that pay due respect for people's individual liberty and individual human rights. And finding that balance is sometimes difficult. But right now, the strategic and tactical approach in China is the correct one. And, uh, and also, as you mentioned, the strategic and tactical approach in places like Singapore. And we're seeing countries more and more uh, having very directed, well-planned operations to detect this virus, contain it, stop it, and slow down its spread. And we want all countries to take that sort of public health evidence-driven approach in the coming days and weeks. Yes, on the modeling, so um, these are not WHO data. Uh, these are data coming from uh, the expert network we have, and we uh, conduct a teleconference on a weekly uh, basis with a number of modeling groups across the world. And so um, those groups usually uh, are publishing their data on the scientific literature, but we have the uh, luck to have some preprint uh, articles, and this is where it comes from. But just a note of caution, you know modeling is based on assumptions, so uh, the, the modeling are getting better when you have uh, better data to put into the model. So currently we, they are still on those um, public health measures using assumptions uh, and uh, I hope that uh, soon we will have much better <coughs> results, or more robust results when we have also better data on the sp speed of spread of the infection. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just uh, try to have one question per journalist so we can give chance uh, to others. Uh, Nina, and then we will go online. Uh, Nina Larson, AFP. Um, on the data, I was wondering, for the, um, the international mission that's in China now, are they going into Wuhan? And also, are they going to go to Xinjiang? Um, because are you, I'm wondering if you are confident of the numbers that are coming out of Xinjiang because, due to the, the fears that it could spread um, pretty quickly within um, the camp uh, system there. Um, and the same for DPRK. They're saying they have no cases. Are you confident that that's correct? Thank you. Um, on the expert team, uh, they're traveling to the two provinces and um, Based on the need, they may also travel to Wuhan. So, um, uh, you know, all options are open. Um, and on the, um, uh, specifically, you know, the uh, Wuhan uh, situation, although this team can also travel, uh, we had our WHO experts already in Wuhan, in, starting from January. So we had presence on the ground, actually. Uh, the presence of the experts could, could also help, but we were there before. Um, on the issue of uh, DP for Xinjiang and others, we, we've picked uh, at the moment uh, the, the two provinces, Guangdong and Qingzhen, because they're the places where we have uh, differential impacts uh, and they're accessible uh, to us, as well as Beijing itself. And then there will be a, a, another decision to move out beyond that again into another wave, and that will again be risk-based. Uh, and, and certainly anywhere where there are high proportions of vulnerable people will be prioritized in that. With regard to DPRK, in fact, uh, um, we have uh, prioritized supplies for DPRK and the supplies for protective equipment should have left I think uh, for there last night or this morning, I'll just need to confirm that for you. We're in very close contact, and we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the mission of DPR, 
DPRK, uh, here in Geneva tomorrow, and our representatives and others there. And we have no reason to believe that there are uh, any specific issues ongoing in DPRK, and we will prov be providing them again with the lab reagents to be able to make the diagnosis. But at the moment, there is no signals or no indication that we're dealing with uh, any COVID-19 there. But the government are very anxious, as you can imagine, as all governments, to make preparations and are seeking our technical and operational assistance to help them get ready. Thank you very much. We will take uh, one or two questions online before uh, we conclude uh, for today. Anne Galland, uh, can you hear us? Hear us? Oh, hello there. Hi. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I was just going um, to ask about the data that came out yesterday, the, the 44,000 cases. Um, that data showed that the death rates are going down as the um, outbreak progresses. And um, I mean, there's a few questions about that because not all the people that would have died would be counted in that. And I just wondered if that fits with what you have seen generally as a general trend, that the death rate was higher at the beginning of the outbreak and is getting smaller. Thank you. It's, uh, it's very difficult to, to make that judgment uh, purely uh, from the data that's been presented in the paper uh, yesterday. Um, um, clearly, there have been at least an apparent drop in in fatality through the outbreak. But remember, at the beginning of the outbreak, what people were finding were the severe cases. So you have a huge bias at the beginning of an outbreak because what you find are the really sick people coming forward. And now we're going out looking for the, sick, the less sick people. So you can have an artifactual uh, and false uh, sense of mortality at the beginning. And we saw that, remember, in the pandemic of H1N1. We saw fatality rates of 10 and 20 percent in the beginning because only the severe cases were presenting. A few weeks later, the pattern was entirely different. So that's an important factor. Um, there is also the fact that the fatality, case fatality is different inside Hubei and Wuhan to the other provinces. And that may also reflect the fact that the pressure on the system in Wuhan Hubei has been so severe. Uh, and the lessons that have been learned in Hubei and Wuhan are being applied elsewhere and people are getting into earlier critical care. One of the issues has been predicting the patients who have the comorbidities and the underlying conditions and ensuring that they're transitioned into the critical care or the severe care uh, pathway early uh, and that we're not blocking up the system with the mild cases. And I think the system in China, for example, has got much better at prioritizing those more likely to be severely ill into the system. It's also very difficult in critical care to ventilate so many patients and do ECMO with so many patients. It takes quite a lot of technical skill. It's not just the machinery, it's the technicians who use that. And again, bringing them up to speed, bringing in the uh, emergency medical teams. Remember, 127 emergency medical teams, nearly 10,000 specialist medical workers were sent into Hubei from outside. Pre trained, pre-certified medical teams who were used to mass casualty management. They would have helped to reduce case fatality. So what we're seeing is both a mixture of the fatality reducing probably because of better and better interventions over time, but also because we're finding more uh, mild cases. So we need to be careful. But what it's very clear, I think, and we need to remember in this, sometimes this is projected as a mild disease and sure most people just get a very mild disease and everything is over in a couple of days. And that's true. And for those who have that and for the younger people and adults who get that form of disease, that's great. But there's a significant number of people. Remember, 20% of people who get this disease are either severe or critically ill. So we really do have to focus on how we can engage in providing them with life-saving interventions. We are graced with the fact that China has a, an advanced healthcare system and can provide such intensive care to so many. Our fear has always been that disease reaching a country with a weaker health system who will not be able to mount such a response. Uh, and again, there are many, if you look at the numbers, many, many people have been admitted to hospital. Many have been released, but there are still lots and lots of people in hospital for a very long time. It takes a huge effort on behalf of a health system to have people in hospital on average for 20 days at the level of intensive care. So the system becomes overdriven by so many people requiring such long-term care. So we can see the stresses in the system, uh, and we need, to be, uh, we need to be mindful of that. But uh, our hope is, as we find more and more milder cases, that the overall fatality of the disease will, will be less, because obviously that's less scary for people. But we must remember that there are at-risk groups, vulnerable people, generally between the ages of uh, 
of 40 and, and, and 79 or older people with underlying medical conditions and they can have a very severe course of disease um, and, and we must be aware of that if disease is imported into third countries we need to prioritize the protection of those individuals and prioritize their clinical care. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we will go to our last question for today and it's uh, Adam Dackett. Can you Adam can you hear Adam us? Adam hear it from, from Engineer. Chemical Engineer magazine. Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, please Adam, go ahead. Excellent. I'm just wondering, do you have an update on how vaccine development is progressing and when you might expect first clinical trials in humans to begin? Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. We, we don't have uh, new data since the research uh, meeting and at this meeting they were discussing about uh, having a candidate vaccine by in, in around 16 weeks from now uh, but again this would be just to have the candidate and then depending on the safety uh, test um, deciding if it will be used in humans so uh, it's still a matter of weeks. Months, many weeks. And, 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 and while we're very supportive and we're working very, very closely with CEPI, uh, with uh, major uh, donors and with the World Bank and others on the strategic investments that are going to be needed to develop vaccines, and they're going, that's going to be a lot of money. Uh, we're very conscious that those funds cannot and should not be pulled away from supporting weaker health systems to get ready. This isn't a trade-off between one or the other. We can save many, many lives in the coming months uh, with or without a vaccine. We all want to invest in the vaccine as a long-term solution, but there are people sick now and there are health systems that are vulnerable now. So we need to balance our investments and invest in the weaker health systems on our own systems. We can save a lot of lives through supportive therapy by testing the drugs we're currently testing and by getting everything in our systems working. And then we do the other things and we develop the vaccine. And we do have to make decisions on vaccine investment now. Uh, and the DG will be working with CEPI, with the World Bank and with other agencies at global level to ensure that we get the strategic investments we need in vaccine development without disrupting the investments we need in national systems to get ready. Yeah, maybe I'd like to add into that um, related to the, first of all, the case fatality. Um, when you see the number of cases in the rest of the world, we have 804 cases and three deaths. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it will not increase. Um, for us, this is a window of opportunity that we shouldn't squander. And we have to invest in preparedness and, and really using this window of opportunity to keep uh, or to stay away from any uh, serious uh, uh, crisis. Uh, so, in order to use the window of opportunity the maximum, we need to have a balance of the use of the public health interventions immediately and then the development of vaccine. We have to strike a balance. The vaccine could be the long term because it could take up to 12 to 18 months and this is like preparing for the worst uh, situation. Uh, but in order to avert any uh, serious uh, problem in the rest of uh, the world and use the window of opportunity to the maximum. It's the simple public health solutions that uh, we should do that should really be our focus while of course uh, preparing for the vaccine. So that uh, balancing act is very, very important. We do what should be done today and then we invest also in the future to prepare for the future. Uh, as uh, Mike said, we're already uh, discussing with uh, partners on the vaccine development, but the approach is striking a balance and giving the right focus, especially to the things that we should do today. But one thing I would like to underline is there is a window of opportunity. If you see the case fatality rate or the, the number of deaths in the rest of the world, lead, it's really low, it's three out of 804. Even the number of cases, 804 is low, but it doesn't mean that it will stay the same. This is a window of opportunity that should not be missed. That's what I would like to underline. And in order not to miss this opportunity, we should do everything to contain it and finish within that window of opportunity. And that's why we're speeding up 
to help countries, especially with weaker health systems, in order to uh, really minimize the uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Thank you to Dr. Ryan and Dr. Briand. I will conclude with this. Uh, just to let you know that our colleagues in Eastern Mediterranean region will hold a press conference uh, in Cairo tomorrow at 11 o'clock Cairo time, 10 o'clock Geneva time, uh, where uh, our regional director will speak to media there on the preparedness in the region regarding COVID-19 uh, and also about uh, how the information should be, should be shared. Uh, this press conference will be uh, broadcast at, uh, w, uh, uh, at WHO EMRA Twitter account, so journalists from here can also follow that and send some questions as well. Uh, we will be sending you very soon the audio file from this press briefing. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.